I now live on the other side of Canada, on the traditional lands of the Coast Salish people. And this is literally the view as I look out my, from my home, the place where I live and work and play. And as I look out there, and that's looking across the, uh, the, the, the headwaters of Burrard Inland, I see two different worldviews. I see the intersection of the nation state and the uh, rise of the industrial society together with the First Nations people. And this is really the crux of reconciliation for me. Reconciling these two worldviews. Two worldviews of a transactional society, the rise of the industrial nation state, with a relational society, with the people of the land. This is the heart of reconciling these two different worldviews that we have to struggle with as we move forward. And I've learned a lot from the traditional people of the Coast Salish. They taught me that we need to hold each other up, that it's our work as humans to hold each other up. That's the other part of the hard work of reconciliation. And we've come a long way. And as an educator, I live in a very privileged world. I have a PhD, I have tenure, I'm white. I come from a good middle class family. I come with a lot of privilege. So what do I do with that privilege? So in my classes, I ask big questions. And I work, I take, bring in other literature, and I ask, I take Jared Diamond's questions. The world until yesterday. What can state-based societies learn from traditional societies. There's lots of learning to do. But we're always learning. What do we learn when the nation state faced the traditional people 25 years ago in the Oakland crisis? Learning was happening then. Learning was happening deeply then about who we are and where we belong. 25 years later, the nation state is looking together with traditional society in a different way. But the questions of what we are learning and how we move forward are still the same. <clears throat> We're always learning. We're always creating communities of learning and growth and moving forward. So one of my teachers was Chief Robert Joseph from Reconciliation Canada, <clears throat> one of the ambassadors. And his invitation to us how do we find a way to belong to this common place together? Our future and the future of our children rest on the type of relationships we build today. So relationships is this common theme in the field of restorative justice. So create one of the foundation principles of restorative justice in collaboration echoes with something I believe Barry Stewart said this morning. It's creating and recreating and recreating again a sense of belonging for each individual and each social group in Canada. We are a pluralistic society and we have to hold each other up not only as individuals but as are the different social groups that make up Canada. And one of the champions of holding up our children, something that Chief Robert Joseph spoke of, is Cindy Blackstock because our young indigenous children are being disproportionately represented in many different systems within our country. And, the people, and what she recognized, Cindy Blackstock, is children are experts in love and fairness. So we have to redefine who our experts are. We're not going to find all our experts in our ivory towers. Our experts live on the streets in the small places close to home. <clears throat> so this, I do a little bit of work at the intersection of children's rights and restorative justice. And <clears throat> the champion of this work is Senator Landon Pearson. And she too says human rights are all about relationships. <clears throat> so I've been doing a, some work at the um, with upholding children's rights. And last year we um, we work with kids that live on the streets, <clears throat> close to the place where I work at Southern Fraser University. On one side of the street is the big university, 
And on the other side of the street are homeless youth that are exploited sexually every day. So I wanted to find a way to start working with these young people. That to use my privilege as in my big institution to find a way for them to belong to. So in this particular model that comes out of the work of Senator Landon Pearson, the whole idea is that us big people create the space for youth to come together. So we work with uh, young people, undergraduates, that at Sanford University and UBC to, <clears throat> to open up a space so we train them to work with the youth. So because some kids that live on the street don't have a very good relationship with adults. So my job was to create the institutional space and then get out of the way for them to do the work. So we worked not only um, across institutions of um, higher education, we worked with children on the street, we worked with Equitas, we worked with the local um, uh, youth agency, and we collaborated together to create that space. And all us adults who represent these bigger institutions worked with the youth, and then we got out of the way so they could do good work. Um, so it was a paradigm shift, and we asked the youth to create the, story, the questions that we asked, because collaboration takes good questions. And the question they wanted to ask, what do you need as youth to live successfully within and beyond your community? So we asked that question, <clears throat> and these are the young people that came in. They lived on the street. It's the first time I've ever had rats in a circle. We had to do a lot of conversation <laughs> about how to create a safe space when some people needed the rat to feel safe. Because kids who live on the streets need someone to care for. And the rat was the person that they cared for. So they brought the rat in, and we learned how to live with the rat in the circle. Little James got a certificate at the end of the circle. <laughs> And it was, I could tell a lot of stories about rats, but I won't. But what you need to see here is that these young people live in the streets. And the first day they didn't feel safe. And they had to be brought in by their youth keeper. But the next day and the next day after they brought their friends. Because the young people that we um, <coughs> used as guardians were holding a safe space for them. And our job was just to get out of the way. So I was delighted. Uh, and then this is quickly just a little bit about how we train them. We, we did lots of training to make sure they could hold that safe space. Um, but we kept on coming back. It wasn't a linear state-based process with a beginning, middle, and end. We created a safe space. We wanted to write a report that was in their words. We went back and we made sure it was in their words, and we kept on coming back and coming back. And then to my delight, earlier this year, the young girl who brought the rat phoned me up and said, Brenda, it's Sexual Exploitation Week. We want to have a forum. And they filled the forum with 200 people and brought everybody who, who uh, needed to be there. And uh, they keep on coming back. Oh, two minutes. OK, here we go. So, so they, told, they told us a lot. I'll share my slides later. But one of the most important things that they said it was a day that the young girl was a rat. Did I get rid of that slide? Anyways. She said, today I belong at SFU. That was a very proud day. Because normally, <coughs> normally she would be on one side of the street, and all the privileged kids would be on the other side of the street. So we're doing the same place thing with First Nations now. Right now we're hosting a dream colloquium uh, called Returning to the Teachings. And we're bringing First Nations ceremony into the institution. Um, and it's the first time this has ever happened. We've done the traditional welcome, but we're bringing institution, First Nation practice into the institution. And it's hard. It's really hard. Because they don't feel welcome there. They don't feel a sense of belonging there, but we want them to belong. We need their ways of knowing to move forward. And the witnessing process is creating a strong social echo within our institution. A very strong social echo of a new way forward. And we're doing it before we hit the justice system. Um, and then walking this path, Simon Fraser University has committed $9 million to addressing the recommendations of the TRC. 
But the money is not enough. We need new way forward in different ways because universities are part of that state-based system. They're very transactional in the way they pass down knowledge and practices. And we have to get beyond those transi transactional ways of knowing to relational ways of knowing to cre creating communities of care. So it's going to take a lot of work, but we're, and the money is not enough, but we're moving forward in good ways. Um, like just yesterday, my students held reconciliation dialogues for restorative justice weeks. So people are stepping up in different ways, um, and they're hosting more circles today. <clears throat> and so what I'm left with is how do we create this connection between human rights, children's rights, Aboriginal rights? Um, in those places close to home, in those small places close to home that are meaningful. And so I, <clears throat> I cite um, Eleanor Roosevelt, because I think America needs a little bit of help right now, strong woman. And so how do we create those social <laughs> unity in those small places close to home? Um, and she called her report in, her, in our hands, and I think it's truly in our hands where reconciliation is concerned. Thank you.